Good morning to everyone. I think we can get started. Uh, good afternoon, sorry, to everyone. <laughs> I'm jet lagged <laughs> still. So, uh, good morning to to good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for being here uh, at this annual meeting of DC3, the Dynamic Coalition Community Connectivity. It's four years that we are uh, meeting every year uh, with new ideas, new projects. Uh, this year we have uh, yet another uh, official outcome of DC3, this booklet on uh, uh, building community network policies a collaborative governance towards enabling frameworks. So uh, we have been, uh, there are copies uh, of the books uh, at the entrance and then there are piles around. So if you want to have one, please take one as a gift. Uh, and uh, is a gift kindly sponsored by the Internet Society. Uh, so uh, thanks uh, Jane and Isaac for having uh, sponsored the publication. Uh, I think uh, besides the, uh, how nice it is to receive a gift, uh, I think it's uh, interesting to also to note how uh, meaningful it is to have uh, produced every year concrete outputs and prove wrong those who say that the IGF is only about talks. It's not only, about, it's not only a talking shop. People, if they want, can... Uh, cooperate, work together, and produce concrete things that could be useful to policymakers, to uh, any kind of uh, stakeholder that wants to use the outcomes. So we are not, of course, obliging anyone to listen to us, but as there, are, there is people here that is in the community network uh, field since decades, uh, years, and is uh, even doing community networks part of their uh, personal and working life, uh, there are in these booklets very interesting ideas that uh, should be considered. This uh, latest uh, booklet uh, is also shorter because it is targeted at policymakers who uh, sometimes have reduced attention span. And uh, so after having uh, 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 dedicated three years of research to the, a broader community with uh, quite large books, we uh, felt the, the need to have more uh, uh, concise and digestible version of our uh, ideas uh, that could be actually uh, readily implemented and used by uh, policymakers. So uh, par part of this is uh, precisely to uh, provide suggestion of uh, what could be the policy elements that would facilitate community networks. So if any regulator, let's say, any government is interested in understanding uh, not only what are community networks, but how to facilitate those initiatives, and so how to facilitate people network self-determination, as I like to call it, so the, 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 the right to build your own network infrastructure to enjoy your fundamental right to pursue your economic, social, political development, which is indeed, of course, already a uh, uh, fundamental right, is based, grounded in fundamental rights, and community networks initiative demonstrates that is not only theoretical, it's a reality. I mean, you guys are doing, uh, are building the internet yourself around the world. You are the living proof that we are not charlatans. We <laughs> aim at facts. So the, uh, the, this booklet is precisely aimed at providing, at helping also other stakeholders understanding that this is a reality. It's a very suitable option to expand connectivity, to enhance the quality of life of uh, thousands and potentially uh, uh, millions of individuals. Uh, it's an option, it's not a silver bullet, but it's a very interesting option. Um, so without further ado, I would like to start by introducing our uh, distinguished uh, panelists of today that uh, have uh, made us the honor of uh, uh, providing some ideas on what their institutions are doing, what their groups are doing, what their communities are doing so that we can collectively understand how can we better work together. Uh, first of all, Edison Lanza, uh, who is a Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Organization of American States. Thank you very much, Edison, for being here. 
on my right, case Sina data from Ofcom. Uh, and it's very interesting that we are finally also starting engaging with uh, intergovernmental and regulators uh, institutions, so it's very interesting. Jane Coffin, of course, from the Internet Society. Uh, Carlos Baca, who is there uh, from Rhizomatica. Carlos Ray Moreno, who is there, sorry, <laughs> from ABC, <laughs> and uh, Adam Burns from free to air and I'm not sure if uh, Julie is, yeah, is, no, you, you are you're not Julie, but you are substituting uh, David, yeah, yeah, sorry, Abdul Karim, thank you very much, Abdul Karim, for being here, and uh, excellent, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I don't want to steal uh, any more time to uh, the, our panelists, so I would like to ask maybe Edison to start by providing a little bit of uh, uh, insights on why the Organization of American States is uh, can be interested in community networks. Thank you, Luca, and good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm the Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression in the Inter-American System of Human Rights. My office is inside of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and the Commission is part of the Organization of American States. Uh, we have a, a mandate uh, around the, all the hemisphere. And full disclosure, I'm not a specialist in, in community networks and technical issues in, in, in this, in this uh, field. But uh, we, we try to promote and standardize solution for uh, um, access, universal access for internet uh, around the, the region. Uh, we did uh, this, this uh, re report about uh, free, open, and uh, inclusive internet. Uh, and also, 10 years ago, the, the, my, my office uh, uh, played a, a very, very important role uh, to, you know, disseminate the standards for uh, uh, community radios, uh, you know, um, share the spectrum. Uh, just, okay. and, um, and I feel that uh, this issue is important to, include, to include, include in, in the you know in the access of internet and the access for information and, and the right to to receive seek and and, and and the spread information in in Americas that you know is the most unequal um, you know continent uh, in the world uh, and also we have uh, you know important communities in indigenous people communities that without uh, we, we lack uh, access of, of uh, on internet. And, and when I, I'm, you know, uh, I, I want to, I want to, to, to thank uh, again uh, the Dynamic Coalition for inviting me and to learn more and, and perhaps we, st we could start a, a process to include in our standards this kind of solution for, for more access to information, education, and knowledge, and, and so on. Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Edison, for providing such uh, such uh, uh, inspirational in terms of hope for future works uh, ideas. It's very good to, to see that the organization, organization of American states is so uh, open to new ideas, and it's very good to know that we can count on you to try to uh, work together uh, to include uh, community networks also in the in the uh, kind of strategy the OIS can uh, can promote for further access to information. And also, we need the cooperation of all of you that are the, the experts in this field. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, speaking about experts, Christina Data, she is director of uh, Spectrum Policy and Analysis at Ofcom. Uh, Ofcom is the uh, British uh, telecom regulator, and they have been doing some extremely interesting work with regard to spectrum sharing, which is something as an essential resource for many community networks. So, uh, Christina, without further ado, we can start with your presentation, which is already there. Excellent. This one. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, thank you, Luca, for uh, for inviting me to this session. As Luca has said, I'm going to bring a slightly different perspective, but a perspective that is quite uh, important, as as we're going to talk about one of the critical enablers of uh, wireless connectivity, uh, that is uh, that is the spectrum. Uh, so, uh, are, are you controlling? Ah, excellent, fantastic. Thank you very much. 
So uh, first of all, don't get scared about the fact that I'm talking about 5G. I appreciate 5G is a little bit possibly of a step forward, but it might have been actually what has uh, made the, the catalyst for our way of thinking with regards to how do we make sure that spectrum can be accessed, because we've started reflecting on uh, the evolution of uh, wireless demand, more and more players wanting to access uh, uh, wireless connectivity in different type of ways. Uh, and uh, our objective, on top of our duty of ensuring the optimal use of spectrum, was actually to make sure that uh, spectrum is not an inhibitor of wireless innovation and wireless, uh, and wireless connectivity. So what, what we've done, and this part of a lot of the discussion that I've, uh, I've listened to uh, today, and I'm sure it's part of a lot of what has been discussed in, this previous, uh, in the previous sessions, is that wireless technology, again, is the enabler of all of the AI, big data, connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, that can deliver significant, uh, significant benefit to society as a whole. In the UK, we've carried out uh, uh, a sort of engagement uh, um, plan and engagement uh, um, with uh, several different uh, uh, stakeholders and sectors to really bring the benefit of digital technology to industry, uh, to agriculture, to health, etc., so that they could understand what digital technology could do for them. And uh, in that context, as I said before, spectrum is incredibly important and is also incredibly important amongst all of these uses for uh, uh, rural connectivity. Rural connectivity... Uh, requiring, uh, in a way, different type of, uh, a different type, potentially, of uh, spectrum uh, authorization. So what is it that uh, we have developed and the model that I think we would like to, to see exported uh, a little bit more, potentially? So clearly, uh, to enable uh, connectivity, you need to have different type of uh, spectrum access models. Uh, there is a role for national licenses, but we also thought there is a, lo a role for local, local and geographical licenses. So we developed uh, and we, uh, we consulted publicly and we had our statement in, in the summer. We developed two new type of licenses. I'm, I'm going to be quick so that we can have a, a lot more conversation uh, later on. One that is uh, opening up access to what uh, are bands in which there is already mobile, a mobile ecosystem, and we're talking about uh, 1800, 2.0. And 38242, but we're also enabled and we've already issued a license uh, access to mobile bands, so that classic mobile bands that are being used uh, across the world for 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, to players that want to use it where MNOs are not using them right now. So our licenses are not exclusive, uh, and that's something that I'm not sure it's, it's the case in many other countries, but we've always said that our licenses are not exclusive. So when the spectrum is not used, we can issue licenses to third parties to actually deliver connectivity. And the big deal that I was mentioning is Vodafone and Strat Open Cell have made uh, an agreement so that uh, Strat Open Cell could use uh, uh, Vodafone 4G spectrum, 2.6 gigahertz, in places where Vodafone is not using it to deliver connectivity in the UK. And, uh, and in, the, in the summer I was with Luca at a conference and everybody was saying, oh, connectivity for the UK? Yes, the UK, little island, there are still a lot of places that are unconnected. So this solution is actually deliver a uh, benefit to citizens and consumers. Uh, uh, the next two slides are a little bit more like what is the model. We've got the two different type of models, a low power and an high power, so a low power is a little bit more on a, of a potentially uh, indoor or uh, in urban areas type of solution, and there we see factories, industry, uh, industrial deployment, uh, plants, at warehouses, etc. And then there is a medium power solution that is also available for um, uh, outdoor, type of, uh, outdoor type of deployment. Uh, the fees, uh, I think, that is a very important point, are extremely, are extremely low as well. Some are based on a base station by base station. Some are based uh, on an area. We're talking about, uh, in the case of these uh, um, shared licenses, uh, 80 pound per megahertz per annum, uh, which, is not, uh, which is not much per base station. In the case of the license to... Um, Mobile spectrum, uh, we're actually issuing licenses that are £950 
for the duration of the license, which is three years, but these licenses can be negotiated commercially with the MNO and can last longer than the three years that we issue, that we issue a license for. So a slightly different, uh, different model from what, uh, uh, what potentially is being seen elsewhere. It can deliver connectivity for us uh, in, uh, in, uh, in industrial uh, sectors, etc., but also deliver, as we have seen with the Vo uh, Vodafone Open Cell model, uh, for rural communities within the UK. This is just, uh, yes, questions, and I think we do that later. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, it's extremely uh, inspiring to see that there are regulators that are sharing a spectrum and actively promoting spectrum sharing in a non-exclusive uh, way and this actually should be a best practice that uh, all regulators around the world should uh, adopt a uh, very good example uh, speaking about experiences around the world i think the the, the person that uh, uh, has probably traveled to almost all community networks around the world is jane coffin uh, and <laughs> nobody, uh, uh, maybe probably with, together with Carlos, <laughs> no, no, nobody uh, better than Jane can provide some uh, insight on uh, what are the latest evolutions in the community network community and how uh, the internet society's work is helping with this. Thank you, Luca, and I may have to throw Machuki and Christian in there who are partners in crime from the Internet Society and Carlos, of course. Um, what we're doing is trying to, and I mentioned this yesterday, listen, <laughs> not impose um, ourselves in places where people, we don't, we don't believe in just suggesting to people that we should come in and go somewhere. Um, but we do hold convening meetings for community building where people may not have thought about building a network but want to. And then we come and suggest that uh, we could help them or we point them in the direction of other people that may be more expert in a certain area. So that's the focus on community building, um, convening events where whether it's a workshop, a summit, or helping um, provide support to others who might be doing that better than we do. So if it's APC or another group, a community network team that wants to put an event together, we often provide small funding for support there too. We work on deployments, and I shouldn't say that we're the ones who, well, some of the team actually does do some of the deployments. Um, a colleague, Jan, was just with Ucha, who's here from Georgia a couple weeks ago, hacking solar panels that weren't working at a certain elevation and a certain battery output, <laughs> taking up a lot of power. Um, but also putting in a LoRaWAN solution with Ucha and others. So some of our teams do actually climb the hills and mountains and um, help put the equipment in. Others help support, like me, where we're helping identify somebody that might need some seed funding or actually um, some major funding to get a project done and or looking at projects that are deployed and coming back in when we forgot to do uh, an assessment on the ground in the beginning, um, which we, we're trying to hold ourselves to a, a better, better metrics next year um, where we're looking at what the community looked like before we went in, who's connected, age, uh, well, not age because if we're trying to stay away from ageism, but we're trying to take a look at who's in the community why they want to be connected, how we can work on um, sustainability, and come back in for metrics so that we can look at impact. And impact is something that is complicated to measure. I'm a huge fan of also looking at the social impact and what networks can do to change people's lives so it's not just the hard statistics on which, which band of spectrum is being used or what type of equipment, because that's something hard you can figure out. Um, those are pieces of data that you can easily find. But it's that impact of the Airbnb um, uh, prescriptions are up about 50% in the villages in some areas in Tusheti. I think that was what a uh, statistic that Ucha's team had given us. We were there a couple of weeks ago. You're looking at changes in small communities, whether it's in Sarantaporo too, where people come back to the villages thanks to the work that's been done. And Vasilis is here, can tell you a lot more about that. But that human impact is not insignificant, particularly for municipal authorities and others who are looking at the fact that people were unconnected. Now they're being connected and there's revitalization in certain areas as well. That is very important to us. Um, we look at policy and regulatory work. We've done some work with um, 
AAPC, Steve Song, Mozilla, and others, where they've written the reports. We've helped support them to do that. We've actually written others ourselves. So from the policy perspective, as um, Luca was saying, we are taking a very strong look at Spectrum with partners um, because we believe, and thank you, Christina, <laughs> that secondary use, sh shared use, and other innovative approaches to Spectrum are critical. Um, I used to work at an agency that is sort of a spectrum authority in the United States. I'm not a spectrum engineer, but I used to look at this and think, my God, why isn't, you know, how is this real estate being divided up and why can't more people get access to it? And we saw spectrum auctions in the United States and some other things. Matt Rantanen, who's sitting here next to me, can show you slides where there are huge gaps in connectivity across the United States, especially in the tribal lands where Big operators were provided with spectrum licenses but don't provide service. So there's massive gaps in the indigenous communities in North America, which is why when people say, why are you looking at US communities or Canadian or other, we've helped support a network in New York City called New York City Mesh, which is a Wi-Fi based network. They're doing amazing work to provide affordable service in places where the service was really, uh, the costs were really high. So it's working on community building, bringing people together. Sometimes it's just connecting people at a meeting like this and getting out of the way. My CEO often says we need to move the furniture out of the way, which means get out of the way when you, when you don't need to be in the way. But are there things we can do to help um, scale work that's going on, support others who do a better job than we do at certain things, and help move the ball forward on policy? We strongly believe that it's important to talk to the people in the ITU that we know quite well to see where we can move the ball forward. I think we've seen with partners like APC, Article 19, and others, you do have to stay in the game even if you're not making progress at a meeting. <laughs> we were at a treaty conference about a year ago at this time and absolutely got crushed. We thought we were coming in. We thought we could get some text into some resolutions at a treaty conference, and they wouldn't even allow the words community networks in the documents. It was a killer. Judith was there as well. And it was demoralizing in some ways because we've been working on this for a long time. But we realized that we'd probably come in at, tactically and strategically. We had to fix that. You don't give up. And I'm pretty stubborn, so what we <laughs> if you if you know me well enough, you know that. But the good news is is that there's so many of us that I think this is something that is now taking traction. At a meeting yesterday, we talked about the fact that we're no longer in a position to say that community networks are a thing that people should question. They exist, they're working. How can we create more sustainability among those communities is part of the policy question too. So I'll stop talking so others can, but there's just ways that we can um, work hard with the UN agencies to make this a reality and not a threat because they're complementary. Um, in some places, they are an alternative, and I know people don't like to use that word. The other issue, I think, that from a policy regulatory perspective, the last barrier is working with organizations like GSMA. They're doing great work. And the companies themselves to say, the big companies, you haven't provided service in 20 something years. Your licenses said you should. Something's wrong with the business model. And if you can't meet that, um, if you can't get that return on investment, partner up with these smaller networks that can get that for you. So it's a licensing sort of joint venture, if you would. Yes, thank you very much. And also, yes, thank you for highlighting this last point that uh, indeed in the uh, peripheral areas or the rural areas that are renown and also academically identified as market failure areas, as the name suggests, is the market fails to uh, connect them to provide the service because there is no sufficient return on investment. So other options, uh, are complementary options, should be uh, uh, explored, uh, utilized, if the objective is the final goal is to provide uh, connectivity, to create connectivity. Another point that I think you uh, uh, hinted at, the fact that uh, it is this initiative, community networks help provide affordable connectivity. But I would also stress that in many cases is also 
high quality connectivity. The New York City mesh you mentioned is a very good example. Barnes also in the broadband for the rural uh, north in the UK, very good examples of the fact that community network may provide the very high quality connectivity, not only uh, affordable. And the last point that I also want to stress, uh, because uh, last year for the community network manual, uh, we had the honor to have also the ITU as a co-sponsor, which this year for bureaucratic reasons was uh, not uh, possible, but the fact that the post phase of the booklet is authored by Bruno Ramos, uh, that is the director of the America's office of the ITU, is an indication that ITU is very uh, also attentive to what we are doing. Uh, there is a lot of room for cooperation with them. And although this year was not possible to have an official uh, uh, logo of the ITU here, the uh, total uh, interest of the ITU is on this work. So I think it's something that you, we really have to keep in mind. Now, to uh, get into the uh, concrete um, dynamics of community networks, I think it would be good to start exploring some examples. Carlos uh, uh, Baca from uh, Rhizomatica uh, has been doing a lot of work leading research for Rhizomatica and uh, coordinating a lot of initiatives in Mexico. Uh, we have a presentation uh, that uh, now we can start putting on screen. And please, Carlos, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for the invitation for the panel. I think it's it's very, uh, it's very happy to me to be with such personalities about the, in the world of community networks. And uh, I work in an organization that's called Rizomatica. And the other two logos is because we are like a consortium of organizations. Uh, in Mexico, we have uh, Redes AC, Redes por la Diversidad y Sustentabilidad. That is an organization that works for many, many years in, uh, ad, in polit political advocacy and uh, to uh, help the, commu the indigenous communities to develop their local contents and something like that. And the CITSAC is a research center that we created this year. And uh, we're trying to do some different kind of research about what happened in the community media and the community networks and uh, how the communities can uh, put together the, their knowledge, their community knowledge, with the technologies and transform it and appropriate it. Uh, I talk uh, in this, in this uh, space, I'm going to talk about the community-owned cellular networks in Mexico. That is one of the projects we, uh, we are developed. And the next one, please. You should have your control. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, in this photograph, is 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 the roof on of a governmental uh, office in uh, a little town in Mexico, and there is nine antennas. How much work? How much of these antennas uh, work right now? Only two of it. Why? Because uh, there is a lot of of effort from the governments that failed and fail because they are not linked with the communities, they are not has the uh, maintenance that is necessary, etc. So the problem to solve the, the access uh, to the telecommunication service, it's important to think more, uh, not only about coverage, See, uh, but only uh, but the, all the things that involves the failure of access. In Mexico, this is the numbers. This is the, the most recent uh, survey about the uh, penetration of, of telecommunication services. And uh, only 5% 5, 5 use a computer, 74% have a cell, a cell phone. This, we all know that this is uh, maybe uh, less because there are counting a lot, all the phones existing in the country, not how many people use really them. And 76%, 67% are internet users. Um, in Mexico, not all the states has the same uh, numbers, and uh, there is a lot of of 
little towns and, and states that the cover the the services the service is not only uh, by the 20% or something like that, like is the case of Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Chiapas, then we uh, work a lot. In 2013, there is a legal reform in Mexico after uh, several years of uh, uh, struggle to make it possible. And there is three, three kinds of, of license that uh, the communities can uh, approach. Uh, one of it is social use. It, this is for all the universities, everything that no is looking for a profit. It, it's in this in this kind of, of concession. There is a, o, other one, social community use, that is for an organization, a, a legal and unregi unregistered organization, an NGO, and social indigenous use. And this is very important because uh, this there is a different way to prove that it's a community that is uh, asking for the for the concession. We have the, the, this one for the uh, uh, cellular uh, service. Uh, there is an organization, Telecomunicaciones Indígenas Comunitarias, is the organization that make up the network, is uh, the one who's ha who has the, the concession, and everything in the model is uh, it's, a, it's linked with the way of life of the communities in the in the in Oaxaca. It's called comunalidad, and it has uh, particularities that only in Oaxaca uh, happen. And uh, the model is based in a, a, a model that uh, when the where the communities are own the, the network, but also they can manage and operate the network with this umbrella that is uh, Telecomunicaciones Indígenas Comunitarias. Uh, right now, we have uh, 16 uh, networks and with a coverage of 60 communities. And uh, it's in, it's it, it changes a lot because some communities decided uh, not to participate or other ones have six years with, with us, et, et cetera. What are, what are some of the challenge we, uh, we are struggling with? Uh, the extension of the network, we have a concession for six states of, of, of the country, but the, as I said, the model is only, it is particular to the communities in Oaxaca. So we cannot do the same in Chihuahua or, or in Jalisco or in, in another states. But it's uh, replicating in some other countries right now, like in Colombia, uh, with, an, with a similar between the model, but, but not the same model. Uh, another challenge uh, is to uh, to find a way to train more people, to develop capacities to the people to can develop their own cellular networks. And there is a, a diplomado, te Tequio Comunitario, it's a, it's a diploma that has a lot of models, not only about the uh, technical issues, but also the political issues about the technology, so the, the people understand that, and we are working actually together with ITU to uh, in a online course with a boot camp in, in February, and there is people from 11 countries in, in Latin America. Another uh, challenge is we have the concession, the law is beautiful, if you go to the Constitution of Mexico, you say, ah, it's very nice. But the system is not nice. We need to change a lot of things. So uh, we have a, a, a legal process because the government want to, uh, to make us pay for, uh, the rates of the taxes, like if we were, uh, like the same 
of a Telcel, a Movi, Movistar, etc., la de, la de big operators. And with our experience, we developed a, a document uh, that we share with the new government in Mexico to what is the, uh, the, the factors that make it better the, uh, the, 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 the public policies to, uh, to let the communities develop their own pro projects of communication and telecommunication. Uh, there is nine of it, I don't, know, don't go inside of each one, but this uh, access to information, agile and simple license system, participate in the programs of governments of coverage, uh, spectrum access, improve the governance of the free uh, use spectrum, access to, fi to fiber, interconnection and peering, access to resources, technological development and research, and develop programs to generate uh, local contents. And finish, one, only one idea that I want to, to share with, with you is uh, this is really, really important. The solutions that the communities themselves give to the technology problems are the only ones that have proven to be efficient and sustainable over the time. It, this is proof. There is a lot of, of studies about that. And the governments uh, must provide an enabling em environment for this to happen. Nothing more and nothing less. The, is, is their responsibility to make this, this uh, uh, environment, but no go so far because it failed like other programs of uh, connectivity and access. And, um, thank you. I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, actually, thank you very much for highlighting, I think, three points that are essential here. Uh, first one is capacity building and the fact that the great work that you uh, have been doing with Rizomatic and, uh, and the other friends uh, like Peter Bloom uh, and Eric working with you uh, in, with capacity building and also the fact that you are now working with the ITU in this is extremely good uh, for all people interested in this. Uh, the other point, and I think this reminds me a little bit uh, what my wife as a, as a psychologist tells me sometimes, which is that the patient is the greatest expert of his or her problem. And what you said about the community being the greatest expert of its problem is exactly the same thing. The w first thing that regulators have to do before uh, reading any booklet or thing is to go and check with the local communities what is the problem and why they are not connected because they are the best expert besides any other uh, researcher or academic in the world. Uh, now, the second thing, of course, is to read the booklet. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the third point that I wanted to make is exactly that many of the points that you have raised licenses, access, and uh, they are all here, and precisely because you and other people here have been providing extremely important, meaningful inputs that are all consolidated here in these policy elements. And what is consolidated here is simply a, a distillation of the work and the advocacy work that uh, people here have been doing over the past decade. So uh, extremely good points. Thank you very much for raising this. And I would like to also to, now to, to pass to Adam. Uh, Burns, that he is going to uh, speak about the more European uh, approach to uh, community networks. We have a pre another presentation here, and uh, particularly we will hear about uh, Freifunk and how uh, this has been uh, going on in, uh, in Germany. Hi, thank, thank you, Luca. Um, do I do anything to this to get the presentation up? Can we put the presentation, please? Ah, thank you. Hi. Yeah, um, I've been involved in community networking since probably about 2000, 2001, and been involved in a lot of community networks across the world, um, from the UK to Germany to Australia and other places. Um, and as well as getting involved in some research projects, uh, but I've also had the pleasure of coming to here, Berlin, Germany, 
um, many times over the last 15 plus years and developing, talking with and uh, scheming with like-minded people who were interested in the philosophy of um, uh, access equality and open networking and communications uh, facilities for all. And I've in particular invited uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Elektra Wagen, Wagen, Wagenrad. Wagenrad. Wagenrad, thank you. Um, who has also been involved in community networking for a similar amount of time. In fact, Elektra is one of the core, uh, core developers and inventors and conceptualizers of mesh networking. Um, and she has also been involved in many, many other um, uh, wireless-related uh, endeavors as well, which we'll get to. I've entitled this talk, uh, Mission Coherence in Collaborative Connectivity. Um, if anyone knows what that means, can they please see me afterwards? <laughs> but briefly, what I mean by this is, um, Freifunk is an amazing structure, an amazing community network here in Germany. They cover uh, numbers, they cover the, uh, pretty well all region and, and uh, federal states within Germany and are starting to, to be popular in other areas in Austria and so on. Um, but it's not all about numbers, numbers of nodes or numbers of users as we call them. It's also about engagement. And uh, I use the word, uh, the phrase mission coherence because I recently here in the burgeoning Berlin hacker scene heard a talk by a man called Julian Oliver, who has been responsible for vol volunteering his time to help with the internet infrastructure for a fairly well-known group now called Extinction Rebellion. This is an environmental group that uh, he has helped with, and in the choice of technologies used, he suggested uh, all the way through to use green data centers that were thermo-powered, um, you know, right through from the power to the presentation of the internet resources that this group needed. The coherence was there with their core values. Um, I would argue that Freifunk here in Germany also has had a long history of maintaining that viewpoint and thus the uh, rather confusing title. First of all, a little bit of history. In 2002, in Berlin, um, a group of uh, artists, engineers, and network act activists met here in Berlin, um, gate crashing an architectural conference. Um, we named the conference Berlon, which was a mesh, again, of the word Berlin and London. And the activists came together and they drafted and co-authored all collaboratively what was called the Pico Peering Agreement. This is a one-page document designed to uh, communicate the understandings, uh, obligations and understandings of different groups or different people who were willing to start to connect to each other over radio or by other, any other means. It was inspired by the original core internet protocols of, of how internet exchanges and internet peering works, but was meant at, as a, at a personal and community level. Um, it promotes the concepts of um, network neutrality, of transparency, of openness, and so on at a low level. Um, if we fast forward today, uh, Freifunk has grown to the size where it has reached some amount of core internet infrastructure. They have participated with a company called In Berlin that provides a non-commercial internet peering exchange dedicated to non-profit and project-based groups that wish to have uh, internet peering to facilitate their work rather than the individual groups trying to set this up themselves. This, uh, this initiative will handle um, peering for all of these initiatives. Uh, a growing number of Freifunk regional groups are now connected in to core peering uh, agreements within the, net, if, within the internet. So I come back to the mission coherence at scale, uh, the, the politics and ethics of network neutrality, 
transparency and openness in local communities is scaling to larger national uh, traditional core infrastructures of, of peering. And so I wanted to tell you a, a story about the evolution of, of Freifunk for that reason. Um, Freifunk also do a lot of outreach work in terms of uh, education, teaching people how to um, do D DIY, how to do it yourself, how to prepare um, routers for uh, mesh networks and how to join the Freifunk um, uh, movement. Um, but beyond just the educational role, um, in collaboration with the Berlin Senate uh, Technology Stiftung Berlin and Tempelhof Project, Freifunk activists installed a node on the roof of an old famous airport in Berlin called Tempelhof, no longer used, but recently uh, reused in a sense, in that recently over 500 refugees um, were housed temporarily in some of the hangars, the old hangars of the old airport. Uh, a, group, a couple of the Freifunk activists installed a Freifunk node on the roof of the building that the hangars uh, were, were part of and uh, allowed and enabled uh, not only just the refugees that were staying there temporarily, but um, the public as well within the Tempelhof Park and um, the government and state uh, senate that also had a, a resource there called the Sol Garage of the Customs Garage where public civil participation processes for, senate, for the Senate Department of Urban Development also took place. So in a virtual way, binding both the disconnected and the hidden with the general public and uh, the state uh, infrastructure and bureaucracy with one sing uh, single uh, symbolic measure. Freifunk also do a lot of other projects with um, refugee uh, uh, groups around Germany, whether it's in the, the housing area or um, helping with facilities in, in uh, in, in the open air as well. The installation also gave uh, access to uh, the public areas on Tempelhofer Feld, including a, a children's circus and uh, a windmill area. But now here is a, a moment where I'd, I'd like to allow Electra to talk about some of her projects, um, not only being a core part of a mesh network protocol development that has enabled community wireless networks around the world to mesh more easily. Um, Electra has worked on a number of other infrastructural things that has helped people in dispossessed areas or remote areas to um, network further. So I'd like to talk with uh, Electra about her motivation for, for doing such projects and to explain each one. Well, first, um this is a project where we now call ISIMS, Independent Solar Energy Mesh System. Uh, we felt the need to develop that technology uh, with the refugee crisis because um, we wanted to support people in informal camps and uh, also in legal camps to get basic internet access because this is something that these people desperately need. So. I had the idea up in my head for a long time to develop a special solar controller that integrates with a router so you can operate a relatively cheap and energy autonomous wireless relay wherever you want to see fit in order to give access to remote locations where the Wi-Fi frequencies that we can use um, cannot reach because there are obstacles in between so if there's a hill or a mountain in between, or the range just doesn't, it's not sufficient, you can put such a solar relay at that location. And, and, and you collaborated with, again, with, tell us about how the collaboration with other external groups went on that. You, you've got uh, the... Uh... Well, I, we, we, I started with a very, very tiny funding out of the pockets of uh, Freifunk. 
but managed to get uh, funding from the Prototype Fund, which is financed by the Berlin Ministry for Research and Education. And of course, this whole work would not have been, been possible without the soft, uh, support of the Open Knowledge Foundation and OpenWT, the guys that make the open source firmware for all those routers. Yeah. But not only that, not only have you been instrumental in mesh networking, not only have you designed an open hardware solar controller to, to allow for more remote installations um, and in communications, but also, let, can you talk a bit about your experiments with Wi-Fi transmissions over TV white space? Well, if I have your attention and your ears, and uh, there are some people that might be influential in this regard, I'm very happy to have the opportunity. Um, in Germany and in other places, uh, analog television was digitalized. So we have now the dig digital dividend. I think that's a proper translation from the German. And uh, we suggest a pragmatic approach to use a part of the spectrum to uh, provide space for community networks uh, using a license exempt part of the spectrum uh, <coughs> where, you should, where we should be able to uh, run mesh networks in a collaborative way. I can tell you in personal conversation about the details. And uh, so the idea was to, to apply for a license, for a testing license, and we got one for a year in order to, yeah, I developed the hardware to do frequency shifted TV white space, but uh, not the official TV white space protocol, but frequency shifted Wi-Fi, because that can be done relatively cheap. That would be a pragmatic approach to relatively quickly use that bands and uh, cheaply give access to remote areas where the traditional Wi-Fi frequencies uh, cannot reach. Yeah. Because the, the fact that we, the Freifunk, our success and the success of community networks around the world, I, I guess the, the enabling factors are that we had an unlicensed spectrum that we could use, the traditional Wi-Fi bands, and we had cheap off-the-shelf hardware that by the means of open source, we could modify so with a device that was actually uh, yeah, enabling you to surf on your sofa without a cable, was actually, it was actually possible to interconnect places in cities and, and beyond. So the next, next logical steps would be to do the same in a band sub one gigahertz, where we can reach further and also at places where people live behind bushes and in the forest. And uh, unfortunately, the TV white space uh, concepts, they all require some, some databases and so on. But if you would have a dedicated spectrum like 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz or whatever, where we, where we can use frequency shifted Wi-Fi, yeah, we could connect remote places in no time. Yeah, and so I made prototypes for that. Fantastic work. I, I cannot overstate um, how much work you've put into um, the realm of community networking in general, in technology and, and the activism as well. Thank you, Electra. Uh, and you did that in association with the media? Um, our regulator for um, television and radio. The MABB. MABB, Berlin Me and Brandenburg. Medienanstalt Berlin Brandenburg. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in all of these uh, little stories and excerpts, there's a lot more to, f to Freifunk in terms of their educational outreach into the community. But I think what really shows is that, the, at least in Freifunk's case, they are extremely s successful in building bridges. You know, it might be a community wireless but they build bridges and, uh, and uh, inroads into other communities, whether it's governments, whether it's the excluded, whether it's the outlier or the core. They help build bridges, and I think policymakers and other people around us can learn a lot about people who are, understand the situation, as Luca sort of said earlier, not only about the core, the average Joe, you know, uh, the urban environment of community wireless uh, has a certain structure, but the outliers, the things that are not seen, the rural areas, the remote places, 
the hidden people. Um, and so it's connectivity in that sense that I think perhaps we can start to talk about further finding more agile and distributed frameworks for policies and, and environments to have these continued positive growths of community networks. And just briefly, I have one further final slide. Picture doesn't get through. Oh. Uh, no, unfortunately. that is very unfortunate. Um, however, the final slide, which is a bit unfortunate, and I'm not sure why it doesn't show, but I would like to dedicate this talk to a good colleague of mine and a lecturer's, to uh, someone who unfortunately passed on Tuesday. His name is Alexei Blinov, and he has been involved in uh, community networking initiatives uh, along with myself for over 15 years. He is an artist, an inventor, an engineer, an astronaut, a laser technician, and a community network, and that's just some of his qualities. We, we both dedicated to Alexei Blinov. Thank you very much for this, and thank you. Really fascinating uh, historical perspective, and very interesting to understand how Freifunk has evolved, including people and really changing life of people. Um, now, uh, I would like to ask to Carlos Aymoreno to provide us uh, some uh, insights from his uh, world travel experiences in uh, community networks. He is another uh, globetrotter who probably uh, is at this time one of the greatest experts of community network in the world due to his uh, frequent, uh, he's not only, uh, he has not only collected a lot of miles, <laughs> he knows the most about, the most diverse community network. Please, Carlos. Okay, when I invite you for dinner. Um, no, my, my condolences to, to you and to all the community networks and, and, and colleagues and friends uh, of, the, of the friend that passed away. My sincere condolences. Um, yeah, it's very difficult to, to take it from there, right? Um, but uh, I guess something that we, we've been working in APC around, around this particular topic, I mean, we can, we can, we can talk about many, many things, but talking about um, polit policies and regulations, something that we realize or something, well, that has become an evidence, uh, even Doreen uh, Bogdan Martin, the director of the ITUD on her opening speech on, on, on Tuesday, she was mentioning that there is significant evidence that the current models are of, of connectivity, of increasing the, 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 or the extending coverage to, to rural and remote areas are plateauing. The, the, the growth at which the extension of connectivity the rate at which the extension of connectivity is, is, go, is, is plateauing, right? So their models are, are not reaching to, to, to the areas of, the, of where people with lower income uh, in remote areas, sparsely, sparsely populated, uh, live. And uh, she said it, the Broadband Commission said it, many other people are saying it, that uh, we need innovative models, we need other models, uh, both uh, business models, uh, both technologies, as Electra were present is presenting, as well as uh, regulatory and policy frameworks, as uh, Christina uh, was mentioning. Um, but um, in order to change that hegemonic thinking, both in society as well as in policy making, there needs to, 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 to be quite a lot of capacity building as well quite a lot of um, change in the sense of how many people are actually trying to make that possible and influence that change of, uh, of a policy and regulatory framework that is stuck on the, on the days of everyone believing that the model of the mobile network operators was going to connect everyone. Uh, and that requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of effort by changing the notion within civil society organizations, within the public per se, that has been convinced that there is one single model of doing things, that's a market approach and, and the private sector approach to doing things, as well as the 
regulators and policy makers that are only hearing the voices of uh, of those private sector stakeholders that just want to modify or, or have the the regulations to to be adopted in a way that benefit their their processes or their, their their interests and in that sense we've been working quite a lot on creating tools and spaces for 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 making that change um, on the one hand and I think uh, we should celebrate there is quite a lot of progress that has been made from let's say two five years ago on the number of civil society people who care about policy and regulation I mean the fact that we are writing these guidelines means that everyone is acknowledging that we need to focus on this and that more people want to learn about this. Not, I mean, this is short, it's for policy makers and regulators, but this is also for, for everyone of, of us. We are in a constant process of educating ourselves on how this is important or what are the elements on the policy and regulatory frameworks, as Carlos was mentioning, that need to be changed. And, uh, and we are more, every, every day we are more. There are more people wanting and showing interest on this. We've created some platforms to, 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 to make that possible, uh, like a policy wiki for trying to understand some of the elements that Carlos were mentioning, was mentioning, some of the elements that are in this book, to actually try to understand in, in the particular country what is the, the regulations and the, and the policies that affect the, 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 the creation of a community network, uh, which ones are conducive, which ones are uh, more hindering the, the processes that, that are required along the lines, I'm not gonna repeat them, licensing and spectrum and whatnot that Carlos Carlos mentioned. Um, so together with that with that wiki and with a lot of uh, training to how to engage in that wiki and, and other uh, participation in other events that uh, we've been doing, there is more and more people who want to engage on, on, on this. Something that Christina also mentioned is the importance of the public consultations and how regulators actually need to respond to the written submissions to the public consultations. What have happened until now is that those public consultations were only receiving con contributions from the private sector. Therefore, the only elements that the regulators had to, dry, to, to draft or to create the resolutions were, well, their goodwill, may, maybe goodwill in people, or the contributions from the private sector. So, so it's not that we were to blame, but we are putting a significant effort on, on writing submissions together with ISOC, together with, with the Web Foundation, the Alliance for, for Affordable Internet, together with um, organizations in the countries where those public submissions are taking place to actually try to, to change things. This year only we've participated in Zimbabwe, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in South Africa. Every time that we hear that there is a public consultation, we try to put in a, a, a collaborative submission from civil society to try to influence. And well, it's up to, we need to see what is the, the real licensing framework that has come up. The only information that there is is a, is a blog from the Ugandan Competition Commission on the licensing framework. But in that blog, in, the, in their own website, they seem to have considered our input and there is now a category for uh, community networks in, 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 the, in the licensing framework. Again, I, we don't have the details, but in the, when they did their, their press release, there seem, they seem to have considered some of the input that we have um, submitted along the lines of stop considering only national scope licensing, consider regional licenses, or small district license, consider as well uh, community network exemptions, and it looks like it has been considered. Uh, the same likely, or I was, well, on Monday it's gonna, it's gonna be released, the, the Competition Commission report, the, uh, the data inquiry, the inquiry in South Africa, and I, I believe there's gonna be significant input that we have provided that is gonna be considered in there. So that's from the public side of things, but we, have, we, need, we need to be more from the public, but we also need to be more from the regulators and the policy makers. Okay? Um, when I started doing this, I thought they were people that didn't care, that they, you know, like they were only there to protect the, the private sector, that they were busy, that they were, that, no, they are, they are people and they have their hearts and they really care, they really care. Uh, on, the, on the last one year and a half, we've, we've trained more than, or we've been, Parti uh, delivering workshops together with ISOC uh, to more than 100 uh, policy makers and regulators in, in Central America and, and Af Africa and Asia with the regional, uh, authority, the, the, the regional associations of, of regulators. And we try to bring one, some, one person from the regulator and one person from the policy maker. And something that 
has been surprising is how open they are to this input, how busy they are, how, how they don't know about these innovations that Electra was talking about from a technology perspective, how do they don't know about the innovations on business model that, uh, that Jane was presenting, how, do they, I, I, how they don't know about the innovations that other regulatory agencies are putting into practice, like what Christina was presenting. So there is a, there is a lot of space for capacity building of, on, on regulatory agencies and, and, and ministries. And, uh, and we've been trying to do that. We've been trying to do that. We've developed a, a training, a training workshop that we increasingly uh, receive more and more petitions to from the regional associations to the country level to implement. And uh, and and there is there is a scope. There is a scope for change. We are um, we are also making that a publication that is accompanying the training workshop. So so there is a a, a guideline that can be read and, and contains all the elements with. All the evidence again. This this is not based on. On I don't know, like a thumbs up. Is 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 actually evidence in other countries with practices like what Christina was saying, like what uh, Carlos was saying. Despite of the implementation, but the Me Mexican framework is amazing. It's allowing to discover what are the issues with the practicalities and the operational. But not every country is as lucky as Mexico. No, th actually, that's why TIC is the uh, Telecommunicaciones Indígenas Comunitarias is the only. Is the only example in the world so far, because of that framework in Mexico. What, how can we make that happen into into other countries? I and mean, we have more and more friends in the in the community network summit in in, in Tanzania last last month. Um, there were representatives from the Universal Service and Access Fund from Uganda, from from uh, from Ghana, uh, from uh, Tanzania. There were ministry representatives from from Cameroon, from uh, Liberia. There are more and more interests. There are more and more people who want to know about this, who are putting the effort into, into knowing, to knowing more about, about what we are doing. And um, yeah, and, and something that also has happened is with the, and I think is to celebrate, uh, is not only the, the Broadband Commission in the so-called Moonshot Report that was uh, released last month that they mentioned uh, in three of the eight objectives of the roadmap, how community networks are important to achieve meaningful connectivity, but also what they, the recommendations no, about uh, dynamic spectrum to make possible TV wide spaces and other approaches to, to allocate the spectrum, not only TV, not only the television bands, but other bands like mo mobile, mobile spectrum. Uh, and something that also happened last month was uh, together again with ISO, we participated in a in an, in the, in an interministerial conference in, of the African Union, and in the declaration of that interministerial conference, the, the ministers uh, direct, or for the next two years, or that's the scope of that declaration, they direct the African Union to promote community networks in collaboration with the African Telecommunications Union. So again, it's not only that they work, it's not only that, but there is that, that patience that, uh, I'm going to quote you, you need to stay in the game despite not making progress. I mean, the, the, it's not easy. I mean, you are there fighting against people who have been playing this game and who have the resources to be at every conference, at every lobbying space, at every public consultation, at every ITU meeting. But we are coordinating ourselves. We are coordinating with ISO. We are coordinating with Article 19. We are coordinating with others to try to bring the voices of the public interest to spaces that were co-opted by the private interest only. And uh, I think we are making, I think we have the evidence. I think we have the, 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 not only the evidence from our side, but they are giving us the evidence as well that they are not able to get there. So, so let's try to clone Christina. Let's try to, to bring Christina to other countries and try to, 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 to make more, you know, to keep on working on, on this because I think we are making progress and there is only more progress to come together with the ITU, together with other, to, with other actors, the only thing that we are seeing is openness. The only thing that we are seeing is that if we were more, they are willing to, regulators and policy makers, they really want to change things and they need the support and the, and the, the capacity to, 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 to be able to do so. And, uh, and, and we are there to do that. There are other partners that are there to do that and we need to be more and we need to have uh, more capacity to, to support more uh, policy makers and regulators. I think it's on our, it's on, the court is on our ball. No, the ball is on our court. And uh, thank you very much. Yes.
So, <laughs> uh, yes, I, th I think we all totally agree in not only with the general uh, perspective that you are uh, providing us, but also with the fact that there is an increasing openness and we see that by coordinating each other, uh, we are achieving uh, incredible results. Uh, with uh, frequently with very limited budgets, but with a lot of coordination. I think that w what this group has been extremely interesting uh, to is to provide a platform precisely for a lot of people, maybe having different initiatives, but try to, point, to find point of convergence. Uh, so while uh, we give the floor to the last speaker, I would like also people in the room to start thinking about what could be potential uh, ideas, uh, topics, uh, initiatives on which we could work together along the next year or years, but from now to the next IGF that will be in Poland, uh, there will be a lot of other things uh, in between. And you and everyone here has its own agenda, uh, potential very good idea to share, a potential very good proposals to share, to find partners here. So uh, we have a, a, a last speaker, Mokhtar. Abdul, sorry, Abdul Karim, sorry, Abdul Karim, and yeah, but Abdul Karim is even better. <laughs> and then we will have a quick tour to understand how can we further work together. Please, Abdul Karim. Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, Julia will not apologize. She didn't meet it because she was in the USA and she cannot come. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim. I am uh, from Internet Without Border. I am uh, head of uh, desk, Central African Desk. So I will do my best. I don't speak English, but I really do my best to transmit the message. So uh, Internet Without Border, we work uh, for, uh, against shutdown. Uh, we work to uh, stop all hate speech. Uh, we work with all African and international organizations to make internet safe, affordable, and um, try to work with certain government who violate this digital rights. Uh, internet is now recognized like human rights, and our uh, actions in initiative, initiative are uh, oriented to the country where internet is uh, seen like a danger by those governments, especially non-democratic governments, uh, where uh, some countries are the authoritarian governments who uh, don't uh, welcome internet like a potential power to improve or develop the country but the danger because the citizen can't find the way to express and to control and to have a new way uh, uh, interactive with the government and citizens. So inter internet uh, give power to citizens. And we work a lot with a uh, certain uh, way to make elections and democracy more transparent, credible, where civil society can control and bring their expertise to make pro electoral processes more credible. Uh, see, all this um, potential of internet uh, is filled like danger in the main of Central African country where there are a president and who were like 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years in power. So, uh, in internet with, uh, without border, we found this idea of community is very important, not because of tool, but this is new strategy to um, uh, force the government to not stop the spread of internet or the violate the right of each citizen to have right to connect. The communities that we worked together before is for example, the community of activists, the community of uh, um, human rights defenders, the community of like uh, political organizations. So this kind of community is different than the community you are building. And the ways that internet are spreading in, in, in those countries are not 
uh, it classical internet like optical fiber of uh, by, uh, lines internet, but a, uh, a phone mobile internet, and the, the, if uh, there are only mobile phone internet, this is very simple for central government to shut down. But now uh, we are very interested to uh, understand how to build a community who can uh, have control of infrastructure, can install their own infrastructure, can there build and control. Even if there are a shutdown, they can continue uh, to uh, spread information, share an uh, important resource, because uh, when internet is shut down, everything is shut down. They are disconnected from the world. This is what we uh, saw what's happening now. So uh, our experience in uh, digital rights defending is that uh, Africa is in a very special period. Africa uh, is facing a new world with new telecoming coming. And the, 700, the 750 million young Africans coming uh, are using this internet to uh, be present in the new worlds are coming. So uh, for us, it's really, really important to um, invest, in, to build a community and reinforce them. But I understood what uh, Marco said, uh, Carlos. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. Carlos said that I, I, I don't. Um, uh, you, you, we cannot account on politician. We cannot account on the United African Union. They have thousands of projects. They never do that, uh, this project happen. Because um, I think that um, we must uh, account on our networks and citizen organizations to force them to do it. We must force them. Not, so, not only uh, by citizen, we can force them by uh, making um, a, uh, what say, concept with uh, international institution who help those country by giving them money for development, giving them help. We can say that uh, the connectivity will be a clause that if those country don't respect or don't do this, they cannot have this. For example, human rights and democracy was unaware the clause that's a clause to help people, uh, country. But if uh, we have not, I don't know in English, levier, I think we cannot uh, a, leverage. a leverage to force them to do, they never, never do uh, uh, what's meaning the project that we bring it because they know that uh, in main country, that citizens' uh, connectivity, because what mean citizen connectivity? What mean community for them? That mean they have not control of circulation of information. Citizens can't have information, even they shut down TV and radio, even they shut down internet, citizens can be connected in the world and have information and spread information. They don't like this. So. Uh, I think that uh, in Internet Time Frontier, we are working, and, and in 2020, we began to launch, uh, deploy the first community in, uh, in Chad by working with civil society organization and uh, laboratory, when our lab, the youth are using to uh, I, I, I promise I won't buy. Come, come. <laughs> come, come. come this. Hello? Come this side, Abdul Karim. Come here. This one works. It's that side of the room. I got a phone. Or use Carlos's, yeah. Yeah. This is a big censorship, so. <laughs> You're not allowed to have information. Right? Yes, uh, we can go to the justice because this is, <laughs> this is a coup. So what I am saying is that because we experienced that, um, uh, why I am speaking about Africa, because uh, Internet Without Border has main of, thank you, main of program 
are to make connectivity and a digital right effective in everywhere. And we are not welcoming because uh, government don't understand what is technology. Most of politicians don't understand what is internet, what is, uh, this technology don't, maitrise, um, what's in English? Uh, master. You just master it. So the approach that we, uh, we have is to make maybe uh, all stakeholders like governments, uh, telcos, and uh, uh, internet users, citizens, to make uh, internet tool of development, tool of development of citizenships, tool of the future. But they don't see it like this. But now the question is how to force them to accept all those super projects that all those organizations have. Many organizations have uh, advocacy and uh, projects, but always they don't uh, cross the border, if I can say in English, because my English is very really low. <laughs> so that's why uh, and, uh, we are really, really interested to work together and maybe join uh, all these partners to uh, create this community uh, who can uh, really help uh, the area where citizens have not freedoms and citizens build a community to make freedoms, make democracy, make maybe have their own future. Because uh, there are different kinds of community because in, for example, a democratic country, the community is built it different. That's the possibility to build a community in area where there are not freedom, very different. For example, some area in Africa, they don't have ex electricity. They don't know what is computer. They don't know, uh, <laughs> they don't access to the technology. So how to mix and use all those uh, possibility to make those community possible and inclusive. Inclusive because the development or those community are not uniform. And we are uh, there to bring our experience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Is it working? You can come here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Is this working? Just to make sure that uh, the people in the in the room is not falling asleep, we are moving a little bit around. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for sharing this and also to highlight, on the one hand, the great potential that community network may have for to re change life in uh, in Africa, uh, where people. I think something we have to also to to, to remind is that the, the areas that are frequently disconnected overlap also with the area where there is lack of instruction, lack, lack of employment. So the, the, the fact of building a connectivity there, having people building the internet themselves, also can dramatically improve people's conditions and also avoid uh, to be victim of shutdowns like you were, you were saying before. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, this uh, is not easy. It's not an easy task, especially in some uh, context that you describe where uh, political leaders are particularly keen on keeping on being political leaders <laughs> for, for a long time. Now, uh, I think Colombian Community Network provides uh, some good uh, solutions. Of course, they are not silver bullet for every problem in the world, but again, they, they, have, they, are, they have a lot of potential. Before we wrap up, because we only have uh, a, a few minutes left, I would like to have uh, to open the floor for inputs, ideas on what uh, you would like this coalition to work on uh, over the next months, uh, ideas for further cooperation. So please do not be shy, take the mic, uh, state your name, and provide any kind of suggestion, any kind of suggestion you may have. In, please, Edison, you have a, a suggestion? No. Yes, please. Can we have, oh, is this working? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, <laughs> doesn't seem so. <laughs> Hello? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, no, I, it's very, very useful for, for, for me, you know, to receive this information. And I think in, in, in different intervention that in, in particular in, in, in our region, 
I think that the inter-American system of human rights is a, a perfect tool to, you know, uh, work to remove the the obstacles to uh, promote this uh, ne network uh, community networks in 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 Latin American region, because it's possible, for example, call for a. Uh, um, you know, join uh, hearing, public hearing. Uh, we have four periods, period of sessions in uh, along the, 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 the year, the next year, and perhaps uh, to present to the commission, uh, under the commission, um, you know, the, the different, well, first of all, the, the, the system and the, the standards, and some particular uh, experience, like Mexico, for example, or comparative with uh, uh, other experience in, in Europe or around the world, and to promote that the, the, the commission, you know, release a, a standard to promote this kind of uh, connectivity in, in, the, in, in the hemisphere, Canada, Canada through Argentina, and, uh, and promote, you know, uh, Change legislative change, uh, best practice in in regulatory frameworks or so on. No, and and for example, uh, we have uh, like an example, uh, um, very uh, interesting and very important um, report uh, of the, our office, special report of freedom of expression, about uh, you know an inclusive uh, spectrum uh, broadcasting in community broadcasting. And this is an example that we could use to build in a report about community networks in the human rights perspective. That is our mandate and our scope. Uh, and we have, you know, public hearings, uh, a special report, and also uh, uh, we have case petition cases. If you have a one case uh, that uh, you want to litigate in in some countries, for example, if. Uh, there are a country in Latin America that don't have the, the framework to, uh, you know, allow this kind of access uh, connectivity. Uh, perhaps you you could go in amparo or uh, compliance in in the state. And if in the this state you don't have response, you could go to the Inter-American Commission and Inter-American Court to litigate against the state for the for the lack of. Uh, Access some ideas that uh, you you could the, and the, the coalition could use the inter-American system in the in the hemisphere. No? Thank you very much, Edison, because those are truly excellent perspective for uh, our for how our coalition could have more impact in the upcoming uh, futures. I saw that there were some hands raising. It. Yes, warrant. Yeah, I'm going to no, be very. Apparently quick. now the, the mic works. So, yes. I'm going to be very quick because we ran out of time. I think we're over time. So I'm not going to say everything I was going to say. But in short, you know, we, we, we need to speed up connections. Our people are disconnected. Uh, we, we, we don't have time. If we're going to meet any of these targets, uh, we need community networks. We need them to explode. We need a revolution. Uh, we need our regulators to start giving the spectrum and the licenses that uh, these CN community networks need to thrive. Uh, I think we also need the global influencers like the ITU to be more progressive, more, more progressive on their stand on community networks, TV white space, and other life-changing technologies that can be used by these community networks because they're not just connecting communities. They're also changing lives. They're also uh, providing digital literacy and helping people become digital citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, would, ask, I would ask Thiago to, be the, our, to give the last word of our session because otherwise we, have, I mean, we will be kicked out of the room. So please, Thiago, uh, a very brief uh, This conclusion. is a huge responsibility. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the panel and for the work that has been done. I would like to provoke the session to think no more um, uh, in terms of principles and uh, results. The principle is, since 2015, we have been discussing the spectrum as something that uh, governments are obsolete in, imagine, in managing, and uh, we have software that is able to do it much better. And also, the principle 